Who knows who this is? Yeah, please tell me. Yeah, very good. It's uh, the Wang Wei Suk. He's a South Korean st stem cell researcher. Actually, he was, because he uh, was committed for fraud in uh, in this in his stem cell research because he published data were actually not true. He, he falsified it, fabricated it. Um, and he was condemned for two years, so there was a system of punishment because he went to jail for two years. After that, that was in 2004, after that he went to, uh, um, he, he couldn't work anymore in South Korea, but he still wanted to continue his work on stem cells. So uh, Myanmar Gaddafi in Libya, and this is actually really true, he bought him actually to come over to Libya and to start a research project on stem cells. And he worked there till the uh, regime fell down and Myanmar Gaddafi was killed. And this is him in, this, uh, uh, in, in the stem cell research project in uh, Libya. Second one, this is John Darcy. Anyone knows him? Yeah? That's good, because he was, one, he was the number one in the Volkskrant, which is a Dutch newspaper, number one uh, of scientific fraud, uh, fraudulent scientists in the world. And he was, uh, he was discovered in the 70s, and he wrote more than 60 or 70 very important papers on cardiology. Uh, he was actually at Harvard at that time, and after that, n nothing is heard from him anymore. And he, he didn't go to jail whatsoever, but it was the first important fraud case. And this psychologist. You know him? Yeah, this is Diederik Stapel. He's a professor in social psychology, and he was actually in the University of Tilburg, and he was in 2011, he was discovered by whistleblowers, to, and he fabricated uh, and invented data, and he published a lot of papers on him. A among him also his PhD students who did their PhD on his data who were actually falsified. So they, they had to retract a lot of uh, publications. And this Maybe a little bit different, difficult. This is Don Polderman, also a cardiologist from Rotterdam, and he's accused for scientific fraud. Um, not condemned yet, but accused, and there's still an investigation going on. Um, one thing, important thing to know, because I think maybe in the discussion we will come on, on this, his research team consisted of him and his research secretary, who, who was actually his wife as well. So there were only two of them who performed the research, which you can question as well. Um, then uh, go back to Dietrich Stapel. One of his important things he mentioned in the big Volkskrant interview he gave after he was, uh, he, he was discovered, uh, he said that the pressure to publish has become too excessive. And that was his main point, his main reason why he committed this fraud. So, um, my name, as, as Reiner told, me, told you, uh, is Yuri Tiding. I'm a psychiatrist, and apart from that, I do my PhD in, uh, on publication culture. And I'd like to tell you something more about it, because um, um, first we're going to tell, uh, we, we're going to start with what is publication pressure, uh, culture exactly. I'll give some examples about uh, publication uh, culture, then I'll uh, zoom in towards publication pressure, because that's my main research topic. I will present some uh, Dutch and Flemish data, uh, as uh, already were published in EOS, uh, and I would like to recap that a little bit, and um, give some information about pressure and fraud. Um, to be, uh, this is important also for the scientific community. Um, th these data are not published yet, so these are preliminary data, so um, that's, also, that's always important to mention. First of all, uh, we go to publication culture, um, and here you see, and that's, that's very um, uh, important to start with, uh, publication culture is, also is mainly about uh, publishing scientific articles. And here you see on the left side, yeah, here you see the number of journals, and you see that it increases in, in 12 years from 2000 to 2012, from the, the amount of journals was 5,500, to here over 8,000. So it increased the loss in this last 12 years. And the same you see here with uh, the number of ma manuscripts. Here it was half a million uh, published manuscripts a year in 2000, and here in 2012 it was more than a million a year. So it doubled, and it doubles every 12 years. So the amount of uh, scientific knowledge 
it has become more and more, uh, 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 has become bigger. And what is the influence of the amount uh, uh, on the scientific community? First of all, uh, the, uh, the scientific output you, you generate as a researcher, but also at a university, uh, is very important for uh, getting fixed position, getting tenure tracks, or getting professorships. So normally, uh, how you can become a professor, you have to, uh, uh, you have to publish a lot because then these are the uh, actual uh, um, re requirements to become a professor. And two major things are important in that one. One is the journal impact factor, and, and Reinhard already told me that we're going to discuss that later on in the discussion as well. The journal impact factor is mainly uh, a measurement who is, uh, who is made for every uh, journal, and it says something about the importance of the journal. So the higher the impact factor, uh, the well, the, the better the quality or the, quanti uh, the quality of the journal, uh, grossly said. Um, um, and the most important thing in that is the amount of articles published in the journal and the, uh, the amount of cited art, uh, of the citations of the journal. So uh, publishing articles is important, but getting cited is important as well. And there we go to the Hirsch Index. Um, that's the H index, and that becomes important as well because it gives uh, ranks to uh, individual scientists. And a Hirsch index of 30, let's say, then you have 30 arc articles published who are, uh, uh, who are cited 30 times or more. That's, that's, uh, the example of 30 is quite huge because then you, then you well, you probably be a professor already then. Um, why I tell you this as well is that uh, the, um, the amount of articles you publish and the, uh, the, the journals you pu publish it in um, uh, influ uh, is influenced by the fundraising. So the more articles you publish, the more chance you get of getting funded and getting money for your uh, research pro projects. But also, if you, if you publish more, um, and you get the funds, you can have more money to, uh, to hire PhD students to do more scientific work, to get more uh, scientific output. And the third thing, which is important as well, and I would like to zoom on in on that one as well, is authorships. So the more you publish, the more, authors you, you, uh, the more, more authorships you have, and the more, uh, the more uh, your status and prestige increases. So the Hirsch Index and the, the journal impact factors, uh, or the amount of uh, 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 manuscripts you publish, increases. And what is the culture then? The, the culture, well, the prestige of, uh, of scientists is, is uh, predominantly built on publication and your citation record. Um, and especially in my case, because I'm, I'm talking only on medical scientists, um, especially in, the, in this case, professors, they have, have, apart from their investigations and the research uh, uh, projects they have, they also have to give education, they also have to do some management on their university, and they also have to um, do clinical work, of course. So this multitasking of professors is, of course, one of the um, one important thing um, why they uh, how, why they become fair, uh, why the pressure on them is pretty uh, high. But uh, as I said, as the universities and the policymakers uh, do uh, give more importance to uh, um, uh, to scientific output, there will be less emphasis on clinical uh, relevance of their scientific work, let alone on site so so societal impact of their work or clinical or educational skills of the professor. And the impact of that, or the, the result of this, this system, is pressure, because they have to, prob uh, to publish to get more funds, to get more articles, and to be high on the ranking. Um, let's zoom in on authorships. This is just an, an example of an article. Uh, uh, it's, it's on genetics, for example. And you see here that you have 25 researchers writing one article. What you have to know, um, and you probably know, is that the first author is the most important because he did all the research uh, normally, and the second author is also normally a pretty important uh, 
person in the, in the uh, research process. And the last one is normally the professor, so he's the supervisor of the research project. And the rest, well, depending a lot, but normally they are just colleagues uh, who, uh, um, well, in, in, in most cases, are the colleagues who, who, who collected the data and just gave the data to the primary researcher. And it's important to know because maybe we, later on we will discuss something more about authorships. Um, let's go to the next slide because I would like to zoom in a little bit. Another example of publication culture is selective publication. Here, here you see some important data. The Food and Drug Administration in the US, they decide if, uh, if, if, uh, if a uh, um, medication will, become, will be approved or not. And what you see here is that if the FDA decides that a medication is good, and the ar articles published on that specific uh, medication, in this case it's uh, about antidepressant medication, you see that almost all the uh, research is, uh, is published. But if the FDA decision is negative, then you see that two-thirds of the research is not published. Um, and that's... Um, and, and that's a shame because negative results are also very important, especially for clinical doctors, because they, if they see that a, spe a specific medication is not working, they, want, don't, they don't want to prescribe it to their patients. Um, and of course, you can, uh, you can think of how come there's a, those data are not uh, published, and then you can think, of course, especially in medication, on the pharmaceutical uh, uh, influence on the on the on the publication. So you see here that the the amount of publish uh, positive results as an uh, articles in industry sponsored is enormous here. And uh, when it's negative results, then it's not so uh, uh, it's not so published. But if you see here. Uh, uh, in, when a research is not industry sponsored, that y then you get more negative or neutral findings of those uh, of the uh, of the data, and that's important, of course. So there's already a bias, well, which is quite logical as well. But still, it's important to know that if it's industry sponsored, there's more there's a tendency towards positive bias. And the last one, I would like th just another example of a publication culture is ghost and guest writing. Uh, ghost writing is uh, when um, when a researcher did a lot of research, but he is actually not on the paper, not w as mentioned as one of the authors, and guest writing is that you invite an uh, uh, an um, a researcher to come on the paper on the authorship's list uh, to improve the um, well. One of the reasons could be that to improve the, uh, the the chance of getting published in a certain journal. So, for example, professors getting asked quite a lot to be part of uh, of a research to uh, to 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 like build a name for the for the research and for the manuscript to increase their chance to publish it. And you see here the original research that it's quite common in uh, in in daily pra in uh, in research practices, like 30% ghost writing and 16% uh, in guest authorships, and that's only in original uh, researches. As you see in the Cochrane reviews, there are even more guest authorships, almost half. Well, then you can say, why do we care about this uh, publication? culture, and especially in medical science, but also in uh, other sciences, is that it can influence scientific results, the bias we have as scientists and, and the scientific community. Uh, it, of course, uh, 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 decreases the credibility of science, because that's at stake, and more importantly, especially for medical sci uh, scientists, that it influences uh, our treatment possibilities and preferences, because if we read an article which is uh, positive, we we tend to uh, prescribe certain medication. And when, when we cannot trust those um, articles and this, this research, who should we trust to uh, get, um, get our patients treated? So that's important to uh, know. Let's go to some publication pressure. I, I uh, give the, um, uh, the um, a definition of publication pressure as follow. The pressure you experience in publishing scientific articles with its consequences for the publication process. And as well, as I said, um, the prestige uh, and the culture right now um, could uh, influence the, uh, the pressure. And, we will, uh, and that's why I did some research on it. 
First of all, this is uh, some data. I, will, uh, I will go through it because it's uh, it's from uh, from uh, Mr. Fanelli uh, on his. Uh, work, this beautiful work published in PLOS ONE about uh, the uh, meta-analysis of uh, scientific misconduct, um, and we already have been to those data. Um, but I, I would like to zoom in a little bit uh, to go to our questionnaire. We performed the survey we did in, uh, in Flanders. Um, first of all, the intention of one of the important things uh, in scientific misconduct is that there's an intention to deceive. Um, then it's going to be a serious scientific misconduct. So that is fabrication or falsification of data, which is uh, fa falsification is more or less the same as a data massage, and plagiarism. And you also have then, uh, as uh, uh, Daniela Fanelli put beautifully on, a, uh, on the graph, uh, questionable research practices. And that can be uh, dropping data points based on a gut feeling or changing the design or methodology or, or results of a study because of pressure from funding sources. It can be biased methodology, it can be intentional non-publication, it can, it can even be delete outliers or salami slicing, which is not very mi misconduct, but just a little bit. It's, it's that you uh, collect data and you make like four or five articles out of it because you want to publish more articles than you could do, it because you could own of these data, you can also publish only one article. That's called salami slicing, which is not real misconduct, but you can question it, of course, and that's why it's called questionable research practices. But you see here as well that there's a continuum on questionable research practices. Um, then we're going to recap the data from uh, Flanders. Um, in total, we included, who completed the survey, were 350 scientists, and it was 54% were male, and it was equally, more or less equally distributed, it was 75 PhD students, 141 postdocs, and 99 medical professors. And again, only, me only medical scientists were included in this survey. Um, and just recap the data of, of uh, the survey, there was the data fabrication, like the worst or the most ser serious scientific misconduct was 1.3%, uh, and the data massage in total was 7.3% makes uh, in about 8% of the two. And just reporting some of the uh, questionable research practices, we uh, discovered what the, the data deletion on the intuition was quite common among uh, medical scientists in Flanders. It was 26%. Uh, not reporting own misconduct was 90%, or unjustified authorship was almost 90, uh, 69%, which is quite high, I guess. So that means that you put an... an, an, an uh, a, a scientist on your list of uh, of, of uh, authors without with, without that he contributed uh, enough for being an author. Um, and this is just an, a cartoon of uh, of what what is misconduct. This is a d data deletion. So you just put one. Uh, uh, you're just deleting some data to improve your the quality of your work and to 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 gain uh, scientific uh, uh, significant results. And this is another one. Uh, here you see, uh, maybe you can read it. You are completely free to carry out whatever research you want as long as you come to these conclusions, which is also, if you already have the conclusion before you, you perform the research, well, why should you do the research then? 